Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about that. This is my first time doing it by Zoom. Um, bearing in mind that it is Friday afternoon, and I know you're busy people. For anyone who was on the uh, uh, workshop on vaccine development yesterday put on by the National Research Council, this is the same presentation. And so if you want to drop off and go out in the sun, I won't take that personally. But I was asked to provide a really quick overview on the regulation of clinical trials and what that means for vaccine development in the COVID-19 space. So just to talk quickly about the regulation of clinical trials, this is under the food and drug regulations um, and the trials for vaccines are reviewed by the Biologic and Radiopharmaceutical Drugs Directorate, which is where I work. So every single uh, clinical trial application is reviewed to determine if it meets the requirements of Division 5. And this is a very fast moving process. We have a 30 day default on clinical trials. So we don't prioritize on the basis of which is the best trial for the purposes of conducting our work, but we're moving through them very quickly. In the current context, we're moving even faster. So we have committed for any uh, clinical trials that are for the treatment or prevention of COVID-19, that if uh, somebody wants to talk to us about starting a clinical trial, we will have a technical meeting within a week of the first request. And we're aiming to review these applications within 15 days, so within half the time of what we normally do. So it's important to note that Health Canada does not design clinical trials. We will provide our best regulatory advice depending on what's presented to us and the questions that are asked, the advice that's needed. Uh, but what we are doing is making sure that we have the same people involved in all of our discussions right now so that we can take a consistent approach to our advice. So I'll talk about sponsors and investigators. A sponsor is generally the, the manufacturer of a product who's legally responsible for the trial. And that includes developing things such as the protocol, the investigator's brochure, which includes all of the safety data that supports uh, going ahead with the trial, and all the chemistry and manufacturing information for, for any product. Sponsors are also re uh, responsible for record keeping and reporting um, adverse effects to Health Canada as the trial goes on. Investigators are often contracted by, by the manufacturer to conduct uh, a trial. So these will generally be physicians who are the, the primary investigators for a clinical trial. And their responsibilities include making sure that all of the people involved in, in, in conducting the trial are trained and are um, qualified to conduct all of their, uh, their activities. The investigators are also responsible for following the, the protocol, ensuring informed consent, and uh, managing all the documentation of the results and, and the uh, process as it goes along. So as I said, if, uh, if we have a 30-day default, this means that if Health Canada does not object to a clinical trial, then it can go ahead. So there are a couple of reasons in the regulations by which we can say no to a clinical trial. First of all is if the information provided to us just isn't sufficient to assess the safety of the product or the safety of the trial. Um, in, in addition, once we've reviewed it, we can say no if, if it looks like the, the trial or the drug will endanger the health of the clinical trial participant or any other person. Uh, we can also uh, refuse to authorize a trial if it's not in the best interests of the clinical trial subject and if it, if it may not be achieved. And this can include as a result of the, um, the trial design or the endpoints. If we're going to issue a uh, negative decision, we'll generally uh, contact the sponsor and, and just ask them to withdraw and that lets them come back at a later time. However, if there are no issues identified, we can issue a no objection letter and a clinical trial can go ahead. There are a number of other steps that need to take place before a trial starts in Canada. This includes uh, research ethics board approvals. There may be requirements through the provinces and under the provincial practice of medicine requirements, and also site specific contracts and agreements with the manufacturers. These are outside the scope of Health Canada's regulatory activities. So my slides are out of date, and in fact, they're out of date every day. So as of this morning, we had approved 40 different trials for the treatment or prevention of COVID-19. And these have included a really interesting mix of pharmaceutical drugs, uh, antivirals, biologic drugs, including monoclonal antibodies, mostly uh, anti-inflammatory actions, and several trials using convalescent plasma. 
We have also authorized the first uh, vaccine trial specific to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and there are uh, a huge number of vaccines in development using a, a number of different platforms. We are continuing to interact with drug developers and with uh, research scientists, and we anticipate that there will be many more um, vaccines that will come to us for clinical trials in Canada. Internationally, regulators have been working together to develop some common principles for what we would look to see uh, with respect to in the, the, the development of vaccine studies. So um, there are some statements that have been issued by the International Coalition for Medicines Regulatory Authorities, ICMRA, and the link is provided here. Um, and these are just statements about the, the amount of preclinical data that would be required before a, few, a first in human study uh, begins. Uh, and this would include some basic data looking at um, characterizing the immune response and the safety uh, for a vaccine candidate. Um, but it may not be necessary to demonstrate efficacy in animal challenge studies before going to the first in human study. It's important to note that uh, out of all of the vaccines that are being developed, some of them are brand new and some of them are using um, well-known technologies. And the amount of, of data, the amount of preclinical workup that will be needed before a product can go into a human study will be very dependent on what exactly the product is and what we already know about the safety and the efficacy of such a product. Another issue of concern is uh, the idea of vaccine-induced disease enhancement. So this is a phenomenon whereby someone who has received a vaccine and then later uh, is infected with the disease may develop a much more severe response. Um, and this has been uh, an issue of concern with coronaviruses. So internationally regulators have agreed that there will be need for very good studies to assess this risk for, uh, for vaccine candidates. Um, and the, again, the amount of data required will depend on what we know about the vaccine, the platform, and what the preclinical data has begun to show. But basically, those sorts of studies of enhanced disease risks will need to be completed before moving to larger studies. Um, I should also note, too, and we'll go back here, that there's still a lot of uh, work ongoing to determine what animal models are most appropriate for these sorts of studies. So we'll be looking to the international community and working groups set up by the World Health Organization to provide further guidance as we go along. In general, what Health Canada has been recommending to uh, developers of vaccines are that we are open to a phase one, two adaptive designs. So studies that propose moving relatively quickly from initial safety assessment to larger populations where we can start to look at measures of efficacy. At the same time, we are recommending that people start slow and build and stagger their cohorts so that there is adequate safety review before moving on to the next step. So basically, we expect people to start with a young, healthy adult population and then begin to plan to go to higher risk populations, including those who are older and have comorbidities. Um, trial designs need to have a very strong safety data monitoring plan, including monitoring for enhanced disease and include long-term safety follow-up. Now, I've been talking mostly about the approval of individual studies. We also are encouraging uh, manufacturers to think about their overall product development plan. So going beyond healthy adults, thinking about older populations and also children after there has been a good characterization of a product in healthy adults. Um, the next few slides are on assays and I'm going to skip through them fairly quickly but the, the points here were really to, uh, to highlight that a variety of different assays of immune response to a vaccine should be used all the way through product development. They should be used in preclinical studies to support uh, the proof of concept. They should be used in early phase studies to help identify the optimal dose that will go into later studies. And finally, they, they need to be uh, well-established uh, serological endpoints to demonstrate and help support claims of vaccine efficacy. Um, there are a variety of different studies that should be used and the ones, uh, what will be needed will depend on the product and they should be a range of studies that are used to demonstrate uh, the development of anti antibody response. And finally, um, the 
assays needed to uh, determine immune response will also have to develop and become more robust as the product moves through clinical trials. So in early phase studies and preclinical studies, these do not have to be fully validated assays. But as the product goes along, there are international guidelines. So ICHQ2 is one of them, which describes the requirements for uh, assay validation that would be needed to support um, final authorization of a product. So um, just to be quick through the last bit, I wanted to flag um, that Health Canada has been making changes in order to facilitate clinical trials for COVID-19. We have recently introduced an interim order, which is a temporary regulatory measure, which will allow um, greater flexibilities in the conduct of, of trials in this setting. To highlight some of the main uh, changes, we've been moving from this default authorization to an active, or default um, go ahead, to an active authorization. So we need to say that yes, this trial can go ahead. We're still aiming to do that within two weeks of receiving, um, receiving the trial application. This authorization allows us to put legally enforceable terms and conditions on the trial. This could allow us to, to, to allow a trial to go ahead with risk management measures um, that we could have not imposed before. It also gives us uh, compliance and enforcement flexibilities, so we could uh, suspend uh, an a single arm of a trial. So under our current regulations, if there was a safety issue with a product in a trial, we would have to stop the entire trial. Um, and now under the interim order, we could suspend a single arm um, if there was an issue with one particular drug, and this would allow the rest of the trial to go ahead, which is really important for efficiencies in this context. Finally, some of the changes through the interim order actually reduce burden on people uh, conducting trials. So for example, um, the amendments, the type of amendments and notifications that would have to be submitted to Health Canada have been reduced. Um, so sponsors can apply either under the usual clinical trial pathway or using the interim order. The process generally remains the same and there's greater guidance provided in, in the link that I provided on this slide. It's on the Health Canada website and you can just search for clinical trials interim order. The last things I wanted to flag are the differences between authorizing a clinical trial to go ahead in Canada and authorizing a product to be sold in Canada. The regulatory framework is, dif is different. So when we are authorizing a clinical trial, we're really looking at a single trial and the, the main aim of the review is the protection of the clinical trial participants. In order to get market authorization for a trial, all of the requirements are under Division 8 of the Food and Drug Regulations. And this is really more about needing a, a larger body of evidence, which generally includes multiple clinical trials um, and very significant uh, chemistry and manufacturing data with the product being produced uh, to good manufacturing practices standards. In both cases though, we require risk mitigation measures and ongoing oversight to ensure that people who are exposed to the product um, are followed. And so that if there are any safety issues, then we can identify those um, and act accordingly. The last slide here just provides the contact information. So for any um, clinical trials or questions about drug authorizations for vaccines or biological drugs, the contact here is the Office of Regulatory Affairs and the Biologics and Radiopharmaceutical Drugs Directorate. And we also have a lot more information about conducting clinical trials uh, for COVID-related drugs on the Health Canada webpage. And with that, I will stop. And oops. <laughs> that was very speedy. Uh, uh, well done. That was a lot of information to take in. Um, I invite anybody who has questions to please uh, either type them into the chat box in the Zoom, um, or we're a fairly small group today, so you can uh, raise your hand and ask to speak aloud, and I will happily call on you but I don't see anybody doing either of those things. As anybody's getting their questions ready, um, I was curious when you were talking about the efficiencies, uh, if there's been any discussion about continuing these, the, uh, the paperwork that addresses these efficiencies, is that something that's going to continue or is that just on an interim basis? 
Yeah, so an, an interim order kind of by definition is, is time limited. You can put it in place for one year and that's it. But many of the things that we've introduced were things that we had already planned. So we were in the process of modernizing the clinical trial regulations. Um, uh, you know, the advantage of the current situation is it pushed us to finalize our policy and, and get this interim order out. So the longer term plan was to be updating the regulations in the next year or so anyway. So um, that would be the next step. So the interim order will go away, but we need to follow it up and make sure that there's not a, a gap after that ends. And how's your experience? I mean, it's been so new, but have you had any experience with it thus far or any problems that have come up? Yeah, so we, we put it into place May 23rd, um, and my team just authorized their first uh, trial under, under the interim order to, uh, yeah, about half an hour ago. Um, Congratulations! <laughs> so that's, that's quite fun. It's, uh, the review process is, is the same um, so far. We haven't yet had to put terms and conditions or use some of the other tools yet, um, so we'll see how those evolve, but I think the actual review process is pretty much the same. Oh, that's great. Uh, Cindy Triton asks, are there considerations around the breadth of the populations that should be involved in the clinical trials in Canada, in particular on a geographic basis, for example, rural and remote, remote area populations accessing trial opportunities? Because normally these areas are excluded from trials as most of them happen in cities. Yeah, so some of the things we enabled with the interim order too, and I, maybe I went too fast, I didn't get to all of the details, but we... Um, we enabled a couple of things. The first was that the, the scope of, of, of healthcare professional who could be a principal, principal investigator had previously been a physician or a dentist only. So we've broadened that scope so that people who are acting within their provincially regulated authorities could also be a, a principal investigator. So this means that someone like a nurse practitioner in a remote community could then become an investigator for a clinical trial. So that provides some opportunity. The other changes that we made were allowing um, remote and non-written informed consent. So you don't need a signature on a piece of paper anymore. So if you wanted to do consent over Zoom or over the telephone, you could do that. And that would also allow um, remote trials to go ahead. Some of the other flexibilities we've introduced just to try to keep trials running, like all trials, not just COVID trials, uh, running during the current situations, we're allowing manufacturers to ship the product to trial sites or to other places where um, if it's safe for participants to take the drugs themselves, we can have the drugs shipped to them. So that's also enabling some more remote activities. So I think all of those flexibilities together is going to, to broaden it a little bit. For larger trials, we are hoping that uh, many of them will be uh, set up in, in multiple sites so we can get a, a broader spread across the country. And certainly for vaccine trials, I expect those will kind of follow where, where the cases are. Um, so where there are more cases, I think that's, that will drive where a lot of the uh, trial sites end up being. Excellent, that's fantastic information. Does anybody else have any other questions? It is a Friday afternoon, so we could just go ahead and end early if everyone feels like they've got a handle on these new regulations and they're all set to do their research. I think that's, I think that I will take the silence as consent. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time and this valuable information and excellent resources. As always, these videos will be posted on YouTube as soon as they're processed. It only takes a couple of hours, so you can share it with any of your researcher colleagues. Um, we, have, we do have two speaker series next week on Tuesday and Friday, uh, but then after that, we're going to be, be moving to Tuesdays only so that we won't infringe upon your summer Friday afternoons. Uh, so thank you so much again, Megan, for your time, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Have a good afternoon.